Good morning. This is the greatest place to be to start your day on a Sunday morning. We welcome everyone to the Cascade Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in North Central Washington. I'm Hideo Fujita. I'm your celebrant. I serve on the worship website and tech teams. We welcome everybody here this morning. We welcome our visitors. We're glad you're here. We welcome everybody and every person of goodwill, just as you are. Whatever your body, whatever body you inhabit, whomever you love, whatever your age, you are welcome. We invite everyone for coffee, treats, and conversation after this service, both in person and on Zoom. This is an opportunity after the service to expand those conversations that you may have had cut short at the beginning of the service so you can complete them. It is also an opportunity to connect with those you do not know very well or have not met. And it is also an opportunity to give feedback to anybody you see up here today. Or your feedback, your comments, any suggestions you have are certainly welcome and much appreciated. Our fellowship is located on the ancestral homeland of the Pascosa. The land from Lake Wenatchee down to the Wenatchee River across the Columbia River is the uh, right across the Columbia River to right here. This is the ancestral land of the Pascosa, the Wenatchee people. For thousands of years, a time immemorial, the Pascosa have steward, been stewards of this land, fishing, hunting, gathering plants for medicine and food, and practicing cultural traditions. The Pascosa, now part of the Confederated Tribe of the Colville Reservation, still live here. We acknowledge that their land has been taken over because of US government broke treaties obligations and allowed uninvited colonists to settle here. We stand beside the community of the Pascosa First Nation people as they continue their traditions to seek to have all their rights recognized. You can find more information about this on our website at cascaduu.org. I call us to worship with words slightly adapted from my colleague, Reverend Amy Williams Clark, who has been serving in Maryland since 2015. We gather in this time of uncertainty, full of unknowns, as angst closes in around us. We light this chalice and the flame draws us together. With a fire, we will cut through the dark dank of isolation as we are warmed by our interconnections. For this moment, this radical moment, we find faith within the knowable bonds of love and community. The chalice and flame symbolize our congregation gathered in principles and faith. For those who are at home with the chalice, please join in with us lighting the chalice. Please join in speaking the lighting words printed in your order of service or on the screen. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. We have a fun story for you this morning for the time for all issues. It is the bear and the kindness of strangers. So this is a story that I wrote and illustrated. So all the children, would you like to come up please? There we go. The Bear Family and the Kindness of Strangers.
Once upon a time, the bear family sleeps against their favorite tree, deep, deep in the forest. Papa bear, mama bear, and baby bear sleep peacefully under the warm, radiant sun. One day on a stormy night, lightning strikes. A fire starts. Oh my! Fire, wildfire. Papa bear gets up, shouts, "Wake up! Run! Fire! Run for your lives!" In a panic, baby bear steps on burning branches. Baby bear screams, "Yow!" Baby bear burns his poor tender paws. What are we going to do? Baby bear can't run anymore. Baby bear can't even walk. Papa bear comes to the rescue. Papa bear comes over, scoops up baby bear. They run from their home in the forest. The forest fills with smoke, cinders, and ashes. They can barely see. To get to safety, they think about the water. They run as fast as they can to the river. They all get to the river safely. Papa bear gently cradles baby bear on his tummy. The cold water cools baby bear's paws. The river carries the bears across the the river, far away from their home in the forest. Now the river carried him across the river to the other side. Poor baby bear is still frightened. Papa bear says, "We're safe now." Hearing this, baby bear manages a small smile. The bears are cold, hungry, and tired. They needed to find a place where baby bear's paws can heal. So Papa Bear carries Baby Bear up a rocky slope. Then they come upon this blue house. Some of you may recognize it. It's right next to a big tree. Now the scary part of their journey is over. They nestle under a big pile of leaves to rest. They sleep soundly, hidden from view beneath the pile of leaves. Then one day, Baby Bear wakes Mama Bear and Papa Bear up. He's saying, "I'm hungry." Papa Bear says, "No problem. I'll go search for some food. You stay here." Papa Bear returns with armfuls of fruits, vegetables, bread, cheese, and their favorite honey. This is the best meal they'll ever have. Mama Bear says, "Where did you find all this wonderful food? I'm so grateful for this." Papa Bear points over there. So over there, see that pantry? There are some kind people who filled my arms full of food for us to eat. They say they like to help strangers. Resting and sleeping and eating beneath the majestic tree and under the warm sun, Baby Bear's paws heal. The bear's hearts warm with the compassion shown by these strangers. Now that baby bear's paws are healed, it's time to say goodbye. But before leaving, the bears go over to find the people in the pantry. They can't find anybody, but they find this note pinned to the front door.
To our new furry friends, we welcome our small, we hope our small act of kindness helped you. There is enough for everyone when we care for each other. Safe travels, sign cuff. The bears never forget the kindness and compassion of these strangers. The bears hearts fill with hope and goodness of the world. They believe helping others in need we can all live in a more peaceful, caring, loving world. The end. And before you leave, the Bear family left some of their fruit for you. So you can, before you take off, they said, you can take an orange with you if you'd like. And everybody else gets theirs after this. <laughs> so those sitting in the middle aisle, would you like to form an arch? Go to each other to find me. long been my spiritual practice to pay attention to my breath and I encourage each of you to notice that you are breathing to be aware of the soothing power of breath sometimes our breaths can be ragged sometimes they come in sorrow the voice of laughter or tears. But now let the breath remind you of peace, of wholeness, of well being. And the fact that we all breathe rhythmically the air that has circled this earth for eons and eons. There was a joke that had been passed around for over a hundred years before Benjamin, Fa Benjamin Franklin famously wrote in a letter in 1785, our new constitution is now established and it has the appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Life is inherently uncertain. And if you have difficulty dealing with that, you will have difficulty dealing with life, says Michael Dugas, professor of psychology at the University of Quebec, a leader in the study of uncertainty and mental health. At heart, being unsure demands a crucial admission that the world is unpredictable, dynamic, flawed, and so are each of us. Our UU approach recognizes that the strength of knowledge in our own minds derives from its very mutability, the changeableness of the world we lean into the possibilities of the world we lean into, for this is a realm of second chances, but it is also a place where things are uncertain and anything can change at any moment. In fact, there are many certainties in life beyond death and taxes, things that cause us to be uncertain. Today, I remind you that in the midst of uncertainty, it helps to be open. It helps 
to seek in what we have faith, what we trust, it helps to take action and make the world as best we can. 2,600 years ago, Gautama Buddha, the Buddha noted five certain things to remember. It was a way of helping people keep from getting caught up in the things that we wanted to cling to and keep stable. It, he wanted to keep these five things from being sources of suffering and fear and anxiety and unease. The five remembrances, they're called. They highlight that first of all, we are all of the nature to grow old. There's no way we can avoid old age. Second, that we uh, might be able to avoid many illnesses, but we cannot prevent all illness. We cannot, we also cannot avoid dying. Death is going to come to each of us, nor can we, avoid change or the endings of anything that we really love. And finally, we cannot own anything but our own actions in this moment. These remembrances are like many good spiritual guides, advice, tempers to our ego, which wants to be strong and certain and enduring and internal. We cling to things and we don't want things to change whether we are very conservative or very liberal, there are always parts of us that don't want things to change. We want to have things that are stable and consistent. I get irritated every time there's another upgrade to Google <laughs> and all of a sudden the menus change and I can't figure out how to get anything done and I have to figure it out all over again. Always changing. Society is changing. And for some people, changes in society, changes in the social structure have caused incredible anxiety and fear, a sense of alienation. So people are struggling with this change. We want to all be free from fear and anger and hatred and division. We want to always move towards community and confidence and comfort and sometimes we want to cling to the things that seem to be giving us that and resist change. But our way of religion, the UU way of religion grew out of doubt, doubt about Christian doctrinal certainty, about authoritarian established ideas. We extol doubt as a rejection of that way of religion that tries to lock everything down. I heard about a UU mom who was talking to her daughter and she said, remember dear, her da daughter had been enunciating these truths absolutely and certainly she remembered her, a smart person always has doubts about things. Only a total idiot could be a hundred certain about anything. And the, and the daughter says, are you sure? And she goes, absolutely, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> For us, doubt is a sign of spiritual maturity that faith without doubt is just a superficial frame that we stick on the world, not real, not vibrant, not able to sustain reality and the changes of world. Doubt is, the idea that doubt is a flip side of faith denies the fact that they're really, the two much work together that the presence of doubt is actually a sign of a healthy theological mind. And its absence, well, it's just one of rigid, rigidity and fear. The Reverend uh, Jay Woolen, you, you, Jay Woolen once wrote, are we a people of holding on or letting go? Do we hold on to certain ideas or do we let go and open our minds and hearts to what is new? Do we hold on to certainty about how things should be or do we let go and live with the uncertainty of ways of being in the world? Do we hold on to what makes us comfortable or do we let go so that we may grow, so that we can be more comfortable? Do we hold on to what makes us safe or do we let go, go, let go to make room to help others feel safe? Are we, letting go 
because holding on too long and too tightly is never good for the soul. We want space to ask questions. We want to remove the stigma of doubt. We do not want our children or our young people thinking that questions are bad, much less that following Jesus means believing six impossible things before breakfast. There's a mix of this commitment to learning and knowing. We always want to keep learning. And even the things that we know, even the things we're certain of, the things that we were told absolutely in school or in childhood, we find are not exactly as we thought. In a skeptical culture, having faith means I must work myself into a kindness and a trust. In other religious cultures we know, that having faith means I have to work myself into a lather, believing weird things that modern scientific age people find incredible. But we understand. Letting go is a way of seeing more, looking farther, knowing more. I've long uh, resented that idea that taxes, taxes, are somehow equivalent to death. The taxes are created by some external authority and forced on us. For me, I've always understood that governance, democracy, and taxes are things that come out of our commitments to one another, not forced on us from outside. There are things that as a democratic community we can change, and manipulate, but we have found more and more that if we're committed to one another, we have to share, find a way to come together. But always there are dangers. I've long had this faith in democracy that if we just shared information, if we all talk to one another, everyone is given a voice, everyone is given a vote, then it'll all turn out great. I used to believe that almost certainly, simply, clearly. I now understand that there are things like gerrymandering and you have to stop the creation of pools of thought and concentration of power. The desire to be in control of the world fights against the desire to be open to the world. Desire to know what is right and put things in order and set the world in the right direction fights against the fact that any course we take waver will fall short that any commitment to a doctrine or idea is a commitment to error because no idea is absolutely perfect but over and over in human communities right now across the world there are strong mostly strong men who come in and say, I know how to fix everything and I want you to vote for me or I'm gonna make sure that you don't even exist, that you don't have a voice. The dictators love certainty and live on certainty even when they make errors, there's no error at all, right? Deny error, deny learning until it's long after and they've already established the new laws and put their critics out, off to, out to pasture and then, then they might admit they learned something. When I was a student chaplain, and this just, we know this is in the culture, democracy is struggling, there are threats to democracy, to community, to justice, to compassion. We understand this in this community. We want to teach people We want to find the powers that will teach people to be open. Remember when I was a student chaplain, a student chaplain in a hospice. And there was a family that had been there. There's a woman in their family who uh, was dying of cancer. And she'd been treated in the hospitals and they'd kept her in the hospitals as long as they could until the final hospital said, there's nothing more we can do. And of course, the hospitals didn't want to keep that bed being used up. So they they released her. And they found an in-house hospice and then where I happened to be chaplain, one of the student chaplains. And the family was there. And this family still only wanted to talk about 
God's power of healing. They only wanted to hear about how God was going to bring her back, going to give her strength, get rid of the illness. They were certain, just so certain about it. And they would pray. Every time they prayed, it was always about God be present in this room. And, you know, I didn't know what to say to these people at all. The, the, the lead chaplain, the paid chaplain, was able to visit with them and work with them, sort of. But he kind of felt, uh, she, she felt somewhat unwelcome as well. They went on with this for two weeks. Two weeks, this woman was laying there in bed and dying, and they would only talk about her life and about resurrection. They were certain of it. And then she died. And instantly, instantly, they began to praise God for having br brought her to heaven. They began to speak about the glories and the joys. They didn't speak about that before. They were thinking about it. They knew perfectly well. I suddenly realized they weren't just closed-minded people. They just had no religious language for expressing their doubt. They had no religious language for expressing fear. They didn't know how to show faith without saying, I'm confused and wounded and worried. All they had was just confidence and joy in their religious practice. It was an insight. It helped me understand people a little bit better. I realized all along they knew, all along they had some wholeness, they just didn't know how to put it into words. Recently, I've thought about this. The people who are afraid, the people who are resistant, the people who are demanding that we go back to some imagined way in the past, I want them to wake up. I want them to be here now with the people who are suffering and seeking and trying to be one community. I think of the people who feel very divided and alienated. The people, I know these people, I met people in Texas who hate, hate Mexicans because they see them as a threat. I have a little button here, it's about, which reminded me that I'm wearing it by falling off, which says that I am, I go by the um, pronouns he and him. And there are people who are filled with fear of those who don't want to be either be he or she. I don't want to be in a world in which there's some fuzziness, there's some uncertainty, there's some possibilities and complexity. They don't want to live in that world because it scares them. They want it to be clear. And how can we help them feel less afraid? How can we help them see kindness and love and the way it thrives when people are allowed to be who they are? I recently read this interchange documented a book by uh, the ethicist John Cavanaugh. There's a time in his life where as a Christian, he went to Calcutta went to Calcutta to work for three months at the house of the dying where Mother Teresa was in charge. And the first morning there, he actually met Mother Teresa. He'd wanted to, he just thought this woman was, had incredible faith and clarity in her life. And, and she says, she asks, what can I do for you? And he said, oh, I want you to pray for me. She goes, what do you want me to pray for? And he said, I have come thousands of miles from the US to find direction in my life. Pray that I find clarity. And she says, no, I will not do that. And he would ask why, you know, he just suddenly feels really confused and he says, why not? And she goes, clarity is the last thing you are clinging to. You must let go. Kavanaugh, realized that he hadn't quite understood what he was doing there. He hadn't quite understood who Mother Teresa was. And he said, but I've always thought that you had the clarity of purpose and religious faith that I long for. And she just laughs. Mother Teresa laughs in his face and says, I've never had clarity. What I have is trust. So I will pray that you find trust.
to find things that we trust, to find the people that we trust, to find the things that we share together helps us get through times of uncertainty and fear and anxiety. To find a little blue house with a big tree that reminds us of the tree we may have lived under in the woods. To find people who are kind and generous and remind us that the kindness that we feel for one another is out in the world in abundance. If only we look for it, if only we seek it. The trust that we're able to build the people from other countries that don't even quite speak our language, if we experience that, we're less afraid of those people. And we know how to lead this nation to be less threatened by immigrants and more open to the whole global community and to help people in other countries manage their world better so that people aren't trying to get out of those countries to come into a whole, and that's only gonna happen if there is a global community in which we all are full of generosity and kindness and caring and sharing and empathy and compassion. The, one of my colleagues, Sarah Eileen uh, Lawal wrote, spirit of love and life in this time of uncertainty, of fear and angst, our nation holds its collective breath. In this time with rhetoric blusters about and words are used as weapons, our nation clenches its fists and tightens its shoulders, eyes squeezed shut, some prepared for a fight. May we, re may we remember that all humanity are people of resilience, that we have faced great uncertainty before, we have weathered storms, we have been consumed by flames of war and violence, and we have risen like a phoenix from the ashes, and we will again. In this time of uncertainty, may we remember the good we go on as we work to move forward together. We, the people, seeking that which unites us with our arms reaching out wide for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in all this. May love, may love and trust prevail. So may it be in these times of uncertainty that we find love reflected in others' faces, that we find trust in a loving community, and we believe in the power of that community to grow forever. Be happy for St. Patrick's Day, not only because of its promise of the greening of the world, but of love, of community, of those who suffered in oppression and alienation who have found their place in the world in joy and gladness for this community and for the great human-wide human hope that we uphold. Let us be glad. Let us give praises on this day and in the days to come. Amen. Please join with me in saying our traditional words, like candle extinguishing words, or if you don't know them, listen carefully. <laughs> we now extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together. Now, if you like, join a circle and sing a benediction to one another.